Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, Socioscientific Issues as Curriculum Emphasis, Theory, Research, and Practice, presented by Dr. Dana Ziedler, Distinguished University Professor of Science Education at the University of South Florida. My name is Tanya Siemens, and I am the um, Community Manager for the STEM Central website. And we are, it's our honor to help host this webinar today. STEM Central's mission is to improve um, retention and recruitment in undergraduate STEM education, in particular focus on broadening part participation in STEM. So we're very excited to um, help host this webinar today. And I'm here joined by uh, Dr. Hector Torres, um, his um, student research assistant Vivek Karki will be co-hosting today. And before we get uh, started, I just wanted to let you know that the webinar will be approximately one hour. Um, we're going to have about half an hour of uh, uh, to 40 minutes of a presentation, um, but we will be and we're leaving some time at the end for questions. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into your to the question box that you see in your control panel. And um, I will, and then we will pause to answer your questions periodically throughout the presentation. I will read the question out loud. Um, if you um, would really like to ask the question yourself, you can um, raise your hand, and we will try to unmute you. Um, and we'll it will have that feature available at the very end if you'd like to answer ask the question um, yourself with your own voice. So raise your hand at the end to um, ask questions. Um, other than that, I just wanna let you know that um, we are recording this webinar. So if you would like to see the recording, um, we will make that available on STEM Central and I'll be sending out a link to that um, shortly after the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to uh, Dr. Hector Torres, who will be um, introducing our speaker. Good afternoon and I'm happy to see all of you uh, participating in this exciting exciting seminar webinar actually we want to call it a webinar it is part of uh, uh, an attempt from Bethune Cookman University to uh, expand uh, scientific literacy research at Bethune Cookman University and so we are really really uh, excited about the fact that we are looking at two frameworks one is the social scientific issues framework and the other one is uh, how do we get students to use argumentation or argumentative discourse. Um, this uh, combination of two uh, topics or issues uh, is an attempt to engage students in dialogues and discussions and debate and argumentation. And we're happy to have uh, collaborating with us uh, Dr. Dana Zeiler, uh, a good friend of mine and um, a distinguished professor of science education at the University of South Florida. Um, we have been uh, just finishing our first year on our, uh, our project, and it's called Investigating the Effects of Social Scientific Argumentation Development on Student Academic Success. Uh, it is an attempt to produce STEM graduates with argumentation expertise uh, using social scientific issues. And so without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, Dr. Dana Zeiler. Well, I don't know what time of the day it is where you are. It could be evening, but thank you for attending uh, and, and for this opportunity to share some of the work we do in socioscientific issues research, also known as SSI. Uh, but to you participants, thank you for your inquisitiveness to at least hear a little bit more about SSI. Jonathan Grooms uh, presented a nice presentation last week on uh, argument-driven inquiry and gave some very practical methods of how to incorporate argumentation into a science classroom. And I see SSI as a, uh, a larger context, a social co cultural context in which to situate different strategies, one of which is argumentation and other discourse strategies, to engage students in the activity of science. Uh, I haven't done this alone. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize a few people that have contributed to this. Uh, there are people actually around the globe, but uh, most notably Sammy Kahn and Troy Sadler, Scott Applebaum, uh, among other global science educators from Sweden and Turkey and South Korea, 
uh, they've all contributed to this. Uh, so I'm not alone in this, this process. So to get started, uh, we'll, we'll jump right into it. And if I can advance my slides, they don't seem to advance. There we go. So greetings from South Florida. This is where I live. And there are two things I love to do. One of them is go to the beach. But the one that I love to do even more is talk about SSI. And that's what we'll do today. I'd like you to take a look at these pictures. And I'll ask you to think about what's the connection. And we'll add a few pictures to the mix. And as you see these pop up on your screen, think about how they might connect to different aspects of science, but what else they might connect to. Now, if you were here in person, we can have a, more of a dialogue about this. But I think as you look at these different topics, and this is just one of hundreds, if not thousands, of topics to explore, you'll see that they connect to the biological world, chemistry, physical science, environmental science. But there's also another common thread that runs throughout these, and that is that they necessarily involve a degree of moral and ethical uh, choices and subsequent implications as well. So as you look at those threads, you can see that SSI are made up of controversial, ill-structured problems. Most of the things that we deal with in science are not clean cut. They're ill-structured because they're situated in a social world. And because this is science, we're going to try to emphasize evidence-based reasoning. It doesn't negate other qualities of emotive thinking, uh, affective thought, passion, uh, but we also want to be able to back up our lines of reasoning with evidence-based reasoning. It's going to require the deliberate use of scientific topics that require students to engage in different forms of discussion, dialogue, uh, and argumentation. For me, social scientific issues necessarily have at least an implicit component, if not an explicit ethical component, that are going to require some degree of moral reasoning. And also, I have an eye on the formation of virtue and character as long range goals that are associated with SSI. So they're going to require multiple perspectives. Uh, it's going to touch on political issues and economic issues as well. And this may sound if odd to those who are new to this, having a, a strong science background, but the goal in situating socioeconomic issues within science education is the eventual spread of what the Greeks called eudaimonia or human flourishing. And so this is what we try to aim for in a larger sociocultural context of science education. So the movement has been one in which at least I've personally been involved with for about 35 years. I've investigated different aspects of this, but because of the help of many fine scholars around the world, uh, we are able to unify both uh, theories and practice from sociology, developmental psychology, and character education, and we combine that into a pedagogical approach of science education. So I'm going to ask you to look at a few images and think about the connection or the disconnect between science and society. Here we see from 1951 some U.S. troops observing from six miles away of uh, the point of detonation of an atomic bomb and watching this as the government then has them perform maneuvers in this area. Uh, and it's really a social uh, experiment. The government, the U.S. government, was uh, conducting these, these tests and using U.S. troops to measure the uh, ambient effects of radiation. And uh, not to worry because we had protective measures in place for getting rid of that 
that dust, dusty you know, radiation. We just can use a broom and dust off the debris. Uh, no one's worse for the wear, right? And more recently, uh, here uh, off the uh, coast of the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Florida and Texas, uh, luckily it didn't affect us where we were in Tampa, but there is the famous oil spill. And we go to June 11th, where it was reported from the industry that about 12,000 barrels a day were leaking. One day later, that had doubled to 25 to 30,000 barrels. And, and within a few days, it was more like 80,000 barrels a day, which converts to about 4.4 million gallons per day of oil. And we remember these horrific images and if, if this doesn't uh, cause one to take offense of how the environment uh, was damaged and realize that there were 11 human lives lost that day, then probably SSI is not going to be effective for that individual. Uh, what's almost equally abhorrent is the fact that in the British Petroleum, the uh, business that's responsible for the oil spill, and its emergency plans, they had in a 900 plus page document, uh, made it clear what the possible environmental impacts could be of such an oil spill. And here, BP made it clear that it knows how to save, quote, seals, sea otters, and walruses in the Gulf of Mexico waters. Now, the image from the beach I showed you before and, and this image you see is, is where I live, and I took that photograph. And I can assure you that I have to drink a lot of pina coladas before I see the image on your right. So of course, what had happened is BP simply cut and paste its environmental impact studies from one location to another, uh, betting that, that nobody really reads these impact statements. The result of this, is that they needed to use a highly toxic chemical, Coruscant 9500, that was pumped into the seabeds at the point of the spill to try to break up that oil, which is toxic to marine life and chemical exposure can cause all kinds of problems uh, in human beings as well, including seizures and death. So it was a Faustian bargain. You needed to think about whether or not you wanted all that oil to wash up in the beaches and affecting the shoreline, the marshes, the wildlife there, or try to break it down to lower levels of toxins that are a moderate poisonous effect. This is a note written by a principal to his teachers every single year at school. And so at the beginning of school, this note would be in the teacher's mailbox and it read, I'm a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians. Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated hikemans. Reading, writing, arithmetic, are important only if they serve to make children more human. And so this is the passion that underlies the approach of SSI. Uh, I'm here to try to convince you that this is an important area, not a frivolous one, uh, and should be a central part of what we think of in terms of scientific literacy. I think that science is traditionally pitted non-normative elements of science against, against normative views. Non-normative elements are things like emphasizing, uh, things are important in science, like the various process skills. You know, we need to collect data, we make observations, uh, we make predictions, uh, we uh, perform experiments. The normative sorts of views are the questions that we tend not to ask ourselves as often as we should. The normative views are questions as what I would hope you would ask your students, should we be doing X? Ought we be investigating this? Do we need to create these kinds of products? Uh, should there be constraints 
on different kinds of research. Those normative views are the ethical part of these socio-scientific issues. And to ignore them is to reject any sense of responsibility. And I think, taken to the extreme, you end up with the views that I just showed you, those pictures that we just saw. So the proposition that I think everybody involved in this project uh, agrees with is that science really, if ever, exists apart from ethical, political, and social types of judgments. And so I'm reconfiguring a different view of literacy, of scientific literacy, than may have been the standard view five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. In my mind, while literacy may not require a moral compass in order just to read and write, understand information, I'm hopefully going to convince you that scientific literacy in the sense that I'm prescribing does. So if you would agree that in a democratic society, probably the three first bullets are the most important features, that it should be open, inclusive to different points of view, different voices, marginalized voices, and the free exchange of arguments and ideas flow back and forth in a democratic society, then you're halfway there to accept SSI as a necessary part of functional scientific literacy. Because these things, I would argue, and I think you would probably agree, are equally important in the activity of science. In addition, we want to accept different forms of knowledge. It's not completely relativistic, but there is knowledge to be had from non-Western views of science. And in science, in addition to those values, we want to base our decisions on evidence and be able to justify that evidence. And of course, we are open to revision. So in doing this, the SSI framework, and we won't go into all the literature associated with this, but pulls from cultural issues, research, discourse and argumentation issues, as Jonathan presented last week, using case-based issues, and importantly, providing a context for understanding how science works, the tentativeness of science, the creativity of it, the empirical nature of science. Okay. All these things, can be used to promote uh, uh, moral development and intellectual reasoning, and in doing so, form functional scientific literacy. So by participating in these carefully crafted, designed activities, uh, units, sessions, students will hopefully develop and reinforce such qualities as reliability and trustworthiness, dependability, altruism, and compassion. Now you might argue that these are just character traits and I can pick them out of a hat. Mm -hmm. And you know, why these, why not other traits? Uh, I, I would suggest that these are central to the activity of science, at least how I construe the moral elements and responsibility we have as science educators, as scientists, as practicing citizens, now, I've never heard a good counter argument that suggests that any one of these are not worthy or bad things that would uh, take away from the spread of uh, human flourishing. So there's a host of research. So this is more than just an ideology. It's a philosophy, it's an ideology, but it's backed up by research on uh, argumentation, on empathy, reflective judgment, all these are outcomes that are out there in, to, to uh, evaluate for yourself to determine if the SSI approach is a reasonable approach at affecting uh, developmental change uh, in, in students. So these broad-based topics are ones in which I have some knowledge and have worked with other individuals to show these different types of outcomes. As science educators, we're also interested in conceptual understanding of science content, and our argument is that this kind of approach uh, enhances students' uh, identity to scientific ideas, even to the non-scientist major, and can uh, accelerate transfer of scientific understanding from one context to another. I know this is more than you care to look at very quickly, so let's look at the second and third. 
these would be characteristics of an SSI approach. Uh, I, I have nothing against using hypothetical scenarios. Uh, I've used them before to just facilitate reasoning and try to point out fallacious reasoning and students' thinking. Uh, but the best SSIs are ones in which you can use real-world scenarios that are not just important to you or to the adult world, but they're important to students' lives to the things that they're involved with. And uh, another feature of SSI is that it, it mirrors what we do in real life in scientific argumentation and discourse. People have to convince others of the worthiness of their ideas, the validity of their ideas, the trustworthiness of them. And this is what we do in an SSI classroom. We mirror those types of discussions. Additionally, uh, I think that the SSI framework does align well with some of the national uh, science education standards, the next generation science education standards. Having said that, my caveat is that I'm not a standards-driven person. I would never make a curriculum based around standards. Uh, I think there's something we need to pay attention to, but good teaching and good engagement of students uh, comes first and it's easy enough to address the standards second. However, I do think it is the case that the kind of things we do in SSI uh, are consistent with the current standards that we have out. Again, more than you want to look at right now. So I just want to emphasize a few of the traits of character that SSI attempts to develop and facilitate. And I'll just go to the middle of this, where it says displaying open-mindedness. I think if you ask most people, people what a, the, a key characteristic of science is, it's the willingness to uh, be corrected, the willingness to change ideas, the, the ability to have an open mind. And that's what this approach attempts to do uh, because of the different perspectives we bring into the classroom. So, how do you develop a curriculum? This is obviously going to be a broad brushstroke for you. Uh, th there are a lot of resources out there, and I just want to present the big idea. And I will also say that even though we have to break this down to steps just to have a discussion, uh, the implementation, as any good teaching, uh, doesn't require the memory of steps. In fact, this approach is probably best utilize once you sort of understand what the different steps might be, they are forgotten. So there's no one order in which to do this. So I present this to you as just a broad overview. And I believe that these slides will may be made available to you as well at uh, some point after this session. So if you look at these topics once again, and you just scan them, you can easily see that they connect to virtually every scientific discipline you can think of. You can look for a range of sources that try to reflect a diversity of viewpoints. Uh, not all controversial issues are SSI. For example, evolution might be controversial to certain segments, at least in the US. Um, sex education might be controversial to some people, but these aren't SSI controversial topics. Uh, so topics in which scientists may disagree, because all the data is not in, they look at data from different perspectives, those make for good resources. And it's not always simply one side versus another, it's usually in, in complex environmental scenarios, for example, multiple sides. So it's essential to try to have resources that reflect those variety, uh, variety of concerns by different stakeholders. And you want to be able to have students have an opportunity to analyze this material in, in ways that are almost free from bias. It takes a while to get to that point. There are different ways to introduce, uh, introduce a topic, different hooks you can use to engage students with headlines, uh, advertisements are a great resource. Of course, YouTube videos, photos, models, other yeah. media. Uh, there's a broad range of materials that you could use to hook students into this. Uh, consider using mini investigations and demonstrations to 
create some dissonance in their thinking. Uh, because there's different kinds of discussion, not everything is an argument, not everything is debate, uh, I still think you need to have some type of ground rules. This is something a teacher has to establish with their class. And if the class can participate in establishing those ground rules, it becomes more of a nice democratic uh, participatory environment. So this is important and it's something that you need to model as a teacher as well too. One of the things to emphasize is that opinions are fine, at least to initial, uh, initially start the conversations, but you need to be able to then back up a viewpoint with data-driven information. Whether you provide that information or depending on the age of the students, they can go out and begin to collect it themselves. Uh, you, you still need to be able to have a rationale or justification for a particular stance. I think it's important to pose controversial questions to the students. There might even be simple things like, should schools charge a fat tax for unhealthy foods? Challenge common knowledge or subject matter. Are calories from fat different from calories from sugar? Are all fats bad for you? Uh, can I really lose weight uh, without diet or exercise by taking these supplements? All kinds of fun questions to get the ball rolling. I don't think students need to have mastered the content before you pose these questions because it's a way to assess their prior knowledge and to potentially identify misconceptions that they might have. Other probes that I think are useful for teachers are probes that we call epistemological probes. What do you think about those statements just to get them on point? Can you ever say which position is better? Uh, when two people differ about these matters, is it the case that one opinion is right or wrong? How is it possible that experts in the field disagree about a subject? So these are different probes meant to get them to think about how they structure their knowledge and how they justify their knowledge as well. Uh, there's nothing that is contradictory about having formal instruction or even lectures and use an SSI approach. Sometimes you need to take a step back and have some formal direction uh, and discussions or even lecture to clarify ideas and clarify viewpoints, uh, misunderstandings. And you need to do this to ensure that the content coverage is consistent with what you hope to cover as a science teacher and that you have enough student understanding to have student engagement as well. This is a conducive to group activities as well. And incidentally, this can be done elementary, uh, middle school, secondary, and college levels as well too. So allowing students to investigate issues in small groups, we found to be most effective. And each student still needs to be responsible for what they learn in that group. They can still write individual essays that reflect their own participation too. Uh, ADI is one fruitful strategy that can be utilized here within these group activities. That's what Jonathan had discussed in more detail last week. Uh, of course, students need some guidance in how to ev evaluate information because there's a lot of misinformation out there, as we know. So there are lots of different ways to do this. One useful way that we've used is the uh, acronym of CARS, which stands for CREDIBLE looking at credentials, peer review. You know, anyone can have a blog. Is that the same as someone who's published in uh, an American uh, Medical Association journal? Is the research accurate, current, comprehensive? Is it reasonable? Does it seem fair? Does it seem balanced? And does it have support? Is, are, are there positions that are backed by empirical research, or at least positions that are clear how the author has arrived at that point of view. So we found this CARS acronym to work well with uh, most students, even at the elementary level, as, and, and as well as middle school and secondary too. There are a variety of products that students can create that you can assess learning with. Uh, it might take the form of uh, authentic products like posters that they create, that they present at a scientific conference, uh, short papers, video presentations, uh, making public service announcements, as well as written tests as well too. 
Uh, the important thing is that the assessment should look for two things, understanding of the scientific information that you're try trying to teach, but further than that, it's application as well. And finally, it's just most important to have fun. I think when classrooms become an exciting, engaging environment which students have fun, uh, the ability to learn is, is, is there. So SSI provides those types of opportunities for creative engagement and exploration by students. And I think once you've established a rhythm for doing this, then you begin to have a better comfort level with your role as a facilitator. And it, it seems a little trite to just say being a facilitator because there's so much more than that. It's like saying, uh, you know, go lead that orchestra. Well, there's a lot going on in an orchestra. So you know something about students' developmental levels. You know about various misconceptions they may have at a given time. You're looking at how students argue. Uh, you're trying to think about how to learn content. If you think about all these things at one time, you probably will get stuck. So you should just go for it. But eventually, when you get comfortable with this, you begin to understand the dynamics that are involved in being an effective facilitator and how much more there is to teaching than just teaching the content. Students first, content second. What does it look like? So here are some pictures of authentic inquiry. There's nothing counter to having formal laboratory instruction, collecting data, and applying it to an SSI at hand. Uh, this is, of course, Florida, so you can have kids uh, put their bathing suits on and go out and collect data of momentum, inertia, Newton's laws of motion. And if you can't do it on a slip and slide, well, you can do it on a skateboard as well. Uh, so this might be information they collect, real data, and uh, timing, measuring distance and time and acceleration, force, uh, because they can apply it to an SSI that might be important to kids. Like, should helmets be mandatory? Should your parents be fined a lot of money if they're not wearing helmets when they ride their bicycle? So this may seem a little silly for you, but to a ch child, this is something that's particularly important. Again, there's that sociocultural aspect. These are kids in middle school and co college uh, collecting data, having debates, having arguments, discussions, and engaging it. I just wanted to give you a feel for what this might look like. Uh, Taken to the next step in which there is activism involved. So it goes beyond classroom to involve the community. This is a picture down in, uh, in Tampa uh, in which parents were invited to come in an evening to hear discussions on different SSIs and the parents became part of the discussions as well. Uh, they became philosophical chairs to help uh, 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 listen to students' points of view. These are their own children, of course, and participate in some of these activities. So that's SSI at its best in a social cultural context. And there are resources out there. One is an NSTA. Uh, this is a book from uh, by Sammy Khan and myself. It's not very expensive. I think it's about $25 of which I get about 25 cents and Sammy gets about 25 cents. But she convinced me how important it was to get this into the hands of ordinary teachers. And she did an excellent job uh, incorporating uh, different strategies, uh, accommodations for students with disabilities, assessment rubrics. But the nice thing about this is that it's student made. The units in here have been developed by students who have gone through SSI courses and gone back into their own classrooms and produced and implement these units too. There are units from K through 12 and virtually every content area in this book. And it gives you a little bit of a background on SSI, some of the things I've discussed today, but it also uh, gives you uh, very concrete strategies for how to incorporate this. And again, you can take this as a larger context and incorporate work like Jonathan has done in argumentation because it's part of what we do already. So I wanted to give you that broad-based overview and stop there and see if you have some general sorts of questions I might help you with. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Zeeler. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to answer, ask it out loud, please feel free to click that little hand raise button and I can unmute you. Or feel free to type your question into the um, into the question box and um, we can I can read it for you. But so far there aren't any questions. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Yes. Okay. Just just a quick one because I think you and I have had this conversation before, Dr. Zeiler, and that is that you know when we look at instruction and instructional styles i mean the professors or teachers are so used to uh, the sort of what, what do we call it the didactic uh, method of uh, instruction um or standing in front of the classroom and uh, and, and, and imparting knowledge rather than, than teaching uh so what what would it take for for us to change that and what if we use SSI? What 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 is what are some ideas that you have to convince? Yeah, well, you know, that that's always the the first step, and the first step is to have an open mind. And if people are really stuck in one way of doing things and, and they're resistant to listening to different ideas, then that's going to be hard. Uh, if they're a little open to thinking about some different ways to teach their content, then I think uh, you can in and engage them enough to try a short version of this. I don't think you have to, you know, wholesale change, throw a light switch, a gestalt, conceptual change, entire curriculum. You can just take one topic one day and try a little bit of this in which you begin to sit back and listen to what students think about this. Mm -hmm. If that mm -hmm. goes well, then the next step would be develop more of a formal SSI activity in which you can have a discussion about a topic and maybe have them go and find some information, bring it back and discuss it. So you can take incremental steps in doing this. You don't have to completely change an entire curriculum. Uh, I think once a faculty member or a teacher begins to see that students will become much more engaged uh, and begin to take some ownership in the learning, uh, hopefully that will compel them to start thinking about now what part of my course is most conducive to this. So it might be the case that at the beginning of a semester, they anticipate that, you know, out of the things I teach, this one particular area would really be a nice fit to talk about some of the social and moral mm -hmm. applications of this. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a little time to sit back and think about everything you cover and take one piece of that mm -hmm. and then try to see where the best fit is. So you don't mm -hmm. need to change everything at one time. Uh, I think that's probably the most prudent approach to take okay. and it does take some upfront time but once you've done it then you've got that module for future classes yeah. another semester you maybe you take one more and you change a few classes mm -hmm. and of course you know that that would also include the students because the students are more so prompt to uh, give me the answer I don't really want to um, have a discussion about anything just give me what is right and I'll go from there so there yeah, it's a, a mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a learning curve for the class too because they're used to being you know passive receivers of information, and they'll exactly. want to go. Well, what do you want me to do, and how how do you want me to do this? But I've seen it year after year. They rise to the occasion, and after a while, most of our students say, "Why can't all our classes be like this? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't spend the whole time you know discussing, <laughs> debating, but it should be an integral part of their education, so they're active participants." So we have some questions in the um, question um, boxes here. So I'm going to go ahead and read them to you. Um, Claudette McFadden asks, uh, would you say more about what you mean by student first and content second? Yes, that, that's hitting it right on the head. Thank you for that question. Uh, you know, I, I, I said when I teach a methods course, I set the students up in a way when they come into the class and I'll say, you know, w what do you teach? And they'll say, and I've misled them by saying what? And, you know, they say, well, I teach biology and I teach chemistry and I teach physical science. And, and of course, I get around to the point that, no, you don't. You know, you teach students, don't you? And, it, and you have to have the mindset that you're not a biology teacher, you're an educator and you have to attend to students' needs. Uh, 
their developmental needs, their reasoning, uh, you know, making them feel wanted in the classroom, making them feel comfortable. Because until you have that, then the students will only be disassociated participants. So mm. by that I mean you need to think of teaching students first, and then the subject matter is the secondary reason why you're there. Hope that clarifies Thank it a you. bit. Well, um, I think, feel free to type another question, Claudette, if you have follow-up. Um, and also, um, Lawrence Duffy has raised his hand. So Lawrence, I'm going to unmute you. I'm gonna try to unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, um, thanks. So you addressed some of the uh, questions I have, but I'd like to go to the uh, time one, and you have experience in biology and uh, chemistry. Uh, in the old acronym chemistry for poets, uh, these uh, mm -hmm. techniques like sensor and the SSI were very great and are a lot of fun for faculty too. But, uh, how about an applied course where you do have that tremendous amount of uh, content? I'm kind of struggling with the allied health uh, chemistry courses and some of the other courses where the books get uh, deeper and you got to run through and you know so you, you you have that thing so this is not in you know the, the liberal arts part of the kind but more the professional side of the curriculum where uh although i agree with you about content that's not the way some of the standardized tests look at it right so the concern is now how will my students fare when they have to then take standardized tests if i spend too much of my time doing this is it taken away from that learning of the content right that's the essence of your your question yeah and i, uh, my, I, I my, I was ahead. just going to so I don't necessarily agree with all the content that's put into these courses, but that's the essence. Right. And and the paradox is believing, and again, we have you know research to back it up, that the time spent in doing this when you can do it well isn't taken away from the content. In fact, they can learn the same content just as well, if not better, more deeply. And apply it and transfer it because they've become engaged in this. And I know that's kind of a blind trust at first until you you see it happen. But we have some research to help back that up. W one case in point, we we done a lot of our research in an anatomy and physiology classroom, and you know arguably that's probably one of the most content driven courses. A lot of terminology and memorization, and the teacher transformed his teaching in a way where he did quite a bit of SSI, and the students did at least as well if not better on standardized testing within the school and on the fcat well uh, that's one of our sorry our uh, state assessments here in florida too so it, it's a little unsettling to, to think about well you know I, I have to run through these chapters and uh, and if i if i spend some time doing this i can't get through well the chapters become a secondary source students are required to begin finding out more ideas, more about uh, the, the, the concepts on their own. And of course, your role is to still clarify things when there are misunderstandings. So that's kind of the, the leap of faith, which sounds odd in science. But to try some of this and see if you can't cover the content, but in a different way, and maybe cover more content that are connecting ideas together. That's the challenge. The thank payoff you. can be tremendous. But thank you for that question. All right, thank you. I'll unmute you now, Lawrence. Thanks for that question. Um, we, um, I mean, I'll mute you. <laughs> we have another question from Lisette Torres Gerald. She asks, can SSI be used to turn the analytical lens on the scientific community itself regarding diversity and inclusion? Wow, that's a great question. That's a dissertation question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, it, it's it's hard. I, I I probably need a little more specificity in your question, but this approach does include diversified viewpoints. It's more inclusive in that people who typically haven't been done well in science, for example, one of the classes we used were an underachieving class. There was an alternative high school. People that have got thrown out of other high schools because they weren't behaving, they weren't engaged, and this was the last stop before they go to jail or someplace else. And they became 
engaged because they finally had a voice. People ask them, what do you think about this? And then can you find some information to back this up? So we engage them in argumentation. When I say we, I was conducting the research, but there was a really good instructor, who uh, a class and teacher that was doing this. So in the sense of being more inclusive, we've been able to uh, have students who typically don't participate in class because they don't think that they are good students become more active in this. In terms of using this as an analytical lens to re go, reflect back on the scientific community, I think those are good uh, papers to be written. Mm -hmm. That's your next paper to publish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd love to. Yeah. Be um, our next question is from Carrie Wickman. Um, I'm working on research in the conditions necessary for instructors to make the shift in pedagogy, providing a lot of uh, PD uh, professional development as well as assisting in, in writing has proven helpful. Um, and then I think she continues her question. A lot of scaffolding is necessary for students, inclusive of sentence stems for discourse. It sounds like a comment. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. Carrie, you're welcome. If, if I don't know if you could turn her voice on or not, but Carrie has done some incredible work in a county that's next to the county I live in, in Hillsborough. Uh, I live in Hillsborough County. She's in Polk County, and she's working on transforming uh, a whole environmental uh, science education curriculum involving, if I'm not mistaken, hundreds of, of students, if not thousands of students, and uh, you know, dozens of teachers. And uh, she's well aware that it takes some time for uh, teachers to feel like they're sometimes supported. They're not doing this alone. They're finding like-minded people. And I think she's indicating that writing portions of this are important uh, for students to develop uh, a better means to express themselves. Yeah. I asked Carrie if she'd like to turn her mic on. Um, she, she might, might be in not, a place where she can't might do not it. Might not be able to, yeah. But thanks, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that's it for the questions. Oh, here comes another one from Claudette. <laughs> <laughs> Just jumped in here. Um, thank okay. you, Dr. Ziedler. You talked about the role of emotions and character. What emotions and or emotions, what emotions um, and or emotions about what? Also, are you talking about both character as it exists at the start of a course? as a primary goal or character development during the course? Uh, well, character development, it, this, this spread of, of, of virtue to be, uh, come all that you're capable of becoming. Uh, I think, you know, if, if students are not fulfilling their potentials, they're not fulfilling their, their sense of, of character. And, and that's something that we can help them achieve. The emotion part of it is that typically in the past, Teachers might say to students, uh, well, you can't you know, argue with emotion. Uh, you know, we just have to have the facts. And in our work, we've shown that engaging students with uh, emotions that connect to uh, empathy, to care, uh, these are different forms of social justice. And they're forms that, that typically are not allowed in a science classroom. Uh, I've heard eloquent arguments that are based out of passion and a sense of caring that are as or higher level in terms of their uh, cognitive reasonability as arguments that are based on rationalistic, you know, factual uh, kinds of arguments too. So uh, I don't want to shut down students from being passionate about something. Of course, they need evidence and, and reasons to help back it up, but the passions are something that are overlooked in school. So a mode of reasoning can be an effective uh, element in the engagement of students in whatever they do in school, in addition to science. We've written more about this, but that's the, the quick answer. But I mm -hmm. think that's a really important question to ask. Thank you. Um, Carrie did reply and said that she'd like us to turn um, on her mic. So I'm doing that right now. Here we go. Carrie, we can hear you now. If you'd like to say, I'm not sure if you wanted to make a comment or not, but you did uh, say I could turn your mic on. So we can hear you now if you'd like to say something. But 
maybe we already said it. Yeah, or it's not working for her. Mm hmm. Oh, oh, she said her mic's not functioning. All right. Well, okay. sorry about that. <laughs> Any more um, questions or comments um, from Hector or I just um, from the audience? Couple. I just sent a couple, I guess, uh, on the chat. If you. Oh, can you in the chat? Mm hmm. You can read that out. Uh, oh, can you speak about best practices and strategies to incorporate SSI? Oh, okay. That's I know that's a broad question, but let me uh, mm -hmm. answer you very succinctly. In one of the slides, you know, we talked about how this is consistent with next generation science education standards, and and so, you know, part of the best practices are uh, having students do authentic science and using inquiry procedures. That's part of what we can do in SSI. Uh, we have people collecting real-time data. We have people doing uh, laboratory experimentations. And you can use that within uh, uh, SSI. Uh, best practices requires or asks that teachers uh, model good question uh, questioning skills. And that's something, obviously, that the teachers are modeling. But the students are beginning to learn how to ask different kinds of questions, uh, convergent questions, divergent questions, broad, narrow questions, uh, probing kinds of questions that challenge people's uh, uh, assumptions and uh, require them to uh, have backings for their claims. So a lot of what we do in SSI uh, are, in, in fact, they, they, they resonate with best practices. And I think they provide a, a, uh, an authentic means to uh, tap into best practices, not an artificial one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another question. So this is wonderful. Thanks for the questions coming in. Um, David Owens asked, Dr. Ziedler, um, one sticking point for a lot of teachers might be that any focus on the types of character development that arise from SSI take time away from a focus on the content that will show up on standardized exams. How do you help teach ration how do you um, help teachers rationalize the value of this added focus? Given the importance of the intangibles that result from SSI instruction, such as moral compassion, do you foresee those to make an appearance on future standardized assessments? Ooh. That's it. <laughs> uh, I, I, David, I doubt we'll probably see those <laughs> out, uh, outcomes on standardized uh, assessments. Uh, we have research that have examined those types of outcomes. You know, you can operationalize it in different ways and not claiming that we have the, the whole ball of wax. Uh, but uh, this is goes back to a question that was asked earlier by a, a gentleman uh, who was concerned that that engaging in this may take away valuable time from covering you know content that's going to show up on on standardized tests and you know our, our research shows that the teachers who engage in this their students do as well but usually specifically better than their students in the past on the standardized exams because they're being more engaged in the content. They've learned the content because it was meaningful to them. So it's hard to convince teachers to take that first step, but once they, well, hopefully the seminar has convinced a few people to take a first step, but once they do, uh, I think they'll find that the student's performance on these standardized exams will take care of itself. It's usually better than it had been looking at baseline data in the past. But thanks for that question, David. I have a question and comment. Uh, Go ahead. From student perspective, uh, I am an environmental science student in a graduate uh, school at uh, Bethany Cookman University, and SSI is an integral part of our curriculum, and we have this kind of discussions, um, social scientific issues all the time. But two things I notice in my classroom is one is whenever we have discussions, uh, we try to bring a lot of backing up from news and um, news is not really, I, I don't believe it's a good source to always back up and that puts our professor uh, in difficult situation a lot of times. And the other thing is we have students from different field, uh, for example, I'm from accounting and finance background in my undergrad. And whenever we talk anything related to finance, everybody in the class just agrees to whatever opinion I have to say. So I also see that as an issue. And if any yeah. comments on that? Well, well, sure. Uh, thank you for that, that question, too. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier 
is the student's ability to look at sources of information and being able to evaluate uh, you know, the trustworthiness of those sources. That's really important. So I think getting information from new sources is, is good, but students also have to ask, but is this reliable? Is this new source from one newspaper at the same level as another? Is the Wall Street Journal uh, the same as uh, somebody's blog? Are there other ways to find information beside news sources? Are there other studies that have been done? Uh, what kind of journals are these published in? So I think it's not out of my character to begin to have students, and especially at the college level, think about uh, the, the degrees of credibility of sources of information, blind review, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, since you have expertise, for example, in finance, people usually acquiesce to expert knowledge. But that's one of the things, Hector mentioned best practices before, is we want students to challenge authority. So science by its very nature, when you look at the philosophy of science, it's supposed to be anti-authoritarian. I might be the best you know, published person in the world, even on SSI, and, and yet I'm compelled to back up my claims at some point if you ask me for the research or the proof. And so if you're doing this well, then you know, experts are to be doubted. It doesn't mean you don't listen to them, but that's the nature of science is to keep everything kind of on reserve until you can find out more information. So uh, I think you hit on two really important points, but the nature of science is to be anti-authoritarian and to doubt the experts. Thank you. It's a great, great comment. Um, it strikes me that engaging students in SSI is a little bit harder for them, maybe. It's a challenging to have the students think through these um, controversial and heart-wrenching sometimes issues. And so I just wonder, do you get any resistance from students? Like, just teach me the equation. <laughs> I don't want to have to think about this too hard. <laughs> we, we have some of that where, where we said earlier, just, you know, what do I have to do? You know, tell me what I have mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. And, and when you don't fall into that, that trap, they begin to produce. And it might be an awkward product at first, it might be a little clumsy, but over time, they get a lot better at it. And, and mm -hmm. they do a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, so you know, for students to take control of their own learning, have responsibility for their learning, uh, it, mm -hmm. is a, uh, it's a new concept, but it's one that's more readily welcomed. It doesn't take as long to get there. Teachers yeah. are accountable for information to, you know, to, to the, the, the state and, and to their school, but students have to get used to the idea of them being responsible for their own learning. Yep, and like you pointed out at the beginning, it's really probably the most important lesson that we can learn in life. We'll take that and apply that to our world more readily right. than that equation you learned in physics or something like I, that. I appreciate all the comments and questions, and I know before Tom clicks out, uh, I wanna thank people who came today to attend this and I hope at least of what your appetite to explore this uh, uh, with an open mind and in, in, in more detail too uh, but thank you for your participation today even though I can't see you I've enjoyed talking yeah. to you. <laughs> yes thank you so much um, Dr. Ziedler and Dr. Hector Torres and Vivek and all of you um, who attended today um, this was really uh, interesting webinar and really appreciate all of the wonderful questions um, if you would like to see a recording of this webinar, we'll have it posted on STEM Central in a few days. And um, any closing, any more closing remarks, Hector? Yeah, just a couple. I, I, again, I, I wanted to thank Dr. Zeiler for uh, his uh, wonderful uh, presentation there, and also thank the participant. There is going to be a survey that is going to come to you. So if you just take a few minutes and and fill that out, give us some ideas as to. Uh, how to improve, perhaps even offer additional seminars on or webinars on SSI and ADI. There will be more coming to you. Uh, so any ideas that you may have, uh, they're welcome. Uh, and also be uh, um, follow us, our research at Bethune Cookman University. Uh, I know Dr. McFadden is on the audience and she's part of this whole process as well. So. Uh, Keep an eye on what we're doing and give us some uh, some uh, ideas as to how can we improve it. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for your uh, time and also Vivek.
All right. So, so long, everybody. Yeah, Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you.